Hello and welcome everyone to episode six of Digitales. My name is Fazan Sayed, and today I have with me uh, Ms. Nadia Sayed, who is actually a lecturer and faculty at IDA and has been there for the last 20 years. She's extremely active in the world of corporate trainings as well. And almost every student who's graduated in IDA has had a lecture with Ms. Nadia Sayed. So hello, Nadia, how are you today? Thank you, Fazan, for that very generous introduction. But yes, IBA has been a very, very long association for me. Yeah. Well, you know, every time I meet a student from IBA, they all speak highly about your class. They right. love the person selling sessions. And somehow you've also roped me into those. And I've loved <laughs> interacting with the students throughout. And I think it's been a fantastic way to keep your pulse on what's yeah. happening with the younger generation, how they're yeah. thinking about career choices and uh, how sort of uh, corporations are also thinking about recruitment. Yeah. And that's going to be my first question is, you know, in COVID, how did things change when it came to recruiting? Do you, did you see something big happen or shift? So, so, you know, when it hit in 2020, obviously it was like this big setback for everybody. And yes, there were organizations that had gone through the first stage of recruitment, second stage of recruitment, and all of a sudden were sending emails around that we won't go through with this. You know, kids were waiting for the last interview. That was not, you know, that never ended up happening. So, yes, there was that, you know, uh, this that huge kind of a break that happened. And then I think very quickly, the world kind of figured out, you know what, this is not going to be going anywhere. And as if I look at the data from 2020, that yes, a lot of big organizations that may have said, OK, we have a you know hiring freeze and we're not recruiting. But then there were companies who realized that there are lots of talented people around. There's a lot of work uh, to be done. So let's get these people on board um, and let's start getting them to do the work. So, you know, um, students who graduate from all the institutions in Pakistan, you know, they're very tech savvy. They're very, very digitally mobile. Um, and slowly and gradually, you know, I would get emails from students um, asking me, okay, this organization has approached me, that organization, can you just help me with this uh, interviews, whatever. And as the, I think, months went down into the summer, September, October, November, and we were nearing end of 2021, I think most students who really wanted to do something got to do something. And I saw that. So there was an active recruiting scene happening. Yeah. And even though it was all work from home at that time, or there was yeah. some sort of hybrid model, you think that made it difficult for the recruitment process or for the students who hadn't practiced online interviews? They always expect, uh, expected it to be in person. How do you think they fared in that? I mean, was it a difficult adjustment for them? And no, did I the recruiters have a difficult time identifying the right candidate? I think both of them were learning, both the recruiter and the candidate. Um, so a lot of them, I mean, there was a lot of forgiving environment, I think, right? Because it was new for everybody. But like I said, students pick up very fast. I think they were probably more agile than somebody who was sitting across and probably somebody who was, you know, senior in age. And I think institutions like IB, I can speak for, caught on very fast. And we started training kids um, for that kind of digital presence, um, you know. And uh, before you know it, I think the entire process completely shifted online from assessment centers to digital interviews, you know, through online case studies. So I think there was, it was just, I think, that initial hiccup but once um, I think the environment realized that we just need to tweak the processes, um, I think now I'm fearing that I don't know if students can sit in front of people, you know, whether, oh, they're wow, going okay. to, whether they've gotten the face-to-face -face interaction, actually, you know, I mean, to walk inside, um, there's a lot more of you exposed versus what you are visible on screen. Um, the environment around you is your own environment, your home, your college lab, your everything else, you mm -hmm. know. Um, now I'm wondering, you know, the mindset has to be to make sure that you get somewhere early, park the car, walk up the steps, all of that. Yeah. You know? And we, you used to come to campus and train people on things like this. Yeah, that's um, true. You know, so now, I mean, you know, it's an adjustment. Though, it's an adjustment. And I think kids have to be flexible now for both uh, kind of scenarios. But tell me something. Do you think that trying, you know, so there was, there was, I would always hear this sort of phrase that, you know, you know, within the first eight seconds or the first 10 seconds, if you're going to hire someone and, you know, that was comprised of the way they walked into the room, the way they were dressed or presented, uh, the way they greeted you, sort of how much confidence they had. And just within that 10 seconds, if you've done recruiting enough, HR people would say that, you know, we can, we can pick whether they'd be a fit in the yeah. organization. 
Yeah. How does that apply? How does that shortcut or stereotype apply when you're doing it online? Because you don't have that same uh, experience anymore. You it's know, just a person why, sitting in front of you. That's why when students come and give me the feedback on the questions, I realize that it's a lot more. The questions have been more. The time has been more. The grilling has been more. Um, you know, it's the, I, ha, I completely find that the, that the uh, interviews are a lot more intense than they were before because, you know, the digital medium is a difficult medium to engage in any case, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more distraction. So where they would ask five questions, maybe 10 questions, six questions. So I felt that students were having much longer interviews. Uh, and do you again, think that, I mean, do you think a person can really present their persona accurately uh, for the role in question using a digital medium? You know, I think it's a case of no choice. And I think recruiters with time have also developed the art of being able to figure out somebody on a digital medium. I mean, a recruiter who's been taking, say, 100 interviews physically over time has learned from his first interview to his last interview, perhaps physical. I think it's that same recruiter who learns from the first digital to the 50th digital. So I think it's that learning process. Um, and eventually, you know, just the placement of the camera, for example, is going to take a recruiter off that, you know, the camera is below and we can see your, uh, you know, lower chin. So mm -hmm. where you would look at how somebody crosses their legs and puts their belongings on a table, you're going to probably judge camera placement, right. you know, noise, background. So, and these are the things that we are teaching now in class. You're talking about light, you're talking about investing in ring lights. You're, you know, we are saying that, you know, it's 2000 rupees, please invest in a ring light so that right. you have a whole lot of interviews lined up. You get the light from the right direction. So these are the new teachings that you're doing. And I think students are picking that up. Any big no-nos that you've come across that recruiters have uh, complained about that, you know, this is definitely something that a student should not be doing or we found this was inconvenient or, you know, what are some of the, 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 the challenges you've seen? Uh, you know, somehow, like I said, that students became, uh, after the initial kind of hiccup where you yourself in class presentations would see incorrect camera placements, I think students have now become very savvy in terms of the basic needs. I mean, conversation is different, but the basic ticks of the visual appearance, um, I think they've become very savvy in that. So recruiter feedback actually on digital uh, communication um, has not been uh, negative at all. It wasn't like, oh my God, you know, the kids are completely like bulls in China shops, not at all. You know, it's almost as if they just kind of responded to the need of the environment. And I'll flip it. What about for the recruiter? Is there something that students have given feedback on that the recruiters are not sensing this correctly or adapting to this correctly? Um, I mean, very small, like something like a lot of students get unnerved about the fact when the recruiter doesn't have the screen on, for example, the camera on. Right. Okay. So again, if you relate that to the past experiences where a facial expression could navigate whether you were you said the right answer or you need to rephrase or that, the students are completely looking at a dead wall. Should, right? should the recruiters have the camera on? Is that a good so, question? So you know, a lot, the couple of kids uh, they were going through a process. It was one particular organization. Recruiters didn't have the camera on. They were all messaging me. Should we ask them to put the camera on? So I basically said, don't say put the camera on rephrase and said, will we proceed with the camera being switched off? You know, so, okay. so there's a bit of a difference between commanding and asking a question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think that is one of the things that um, kind of has been, uh, I mean, highlighted a lot that it's, it's, it's a bit of a struggle communicating when you don't see the physical, you know, the expressions. And what about in terms of the type of recruitment that was taking place? Historically, IBA has been um, a center for multinationals or large national corporations to recruit from. We're seeing this big surge in startups in the tech digital space. And, you know, is, is the, the question that arises is that are they recruiting from the same talent pool? And if so, do they have to give out the same compensation level? Because startups have limited cash. They can burn through their cash very quickly. And it's a much uh, more different work environment, the perks, benefits, the hours, you know, so should a student, how should a student think about that? That I'm going to a startup, I have the same comp as a multinational, but what if they run out of cash before I can even spend my third month there? See, Fezan, you also have to see the perspective that before, um, say, 100 kids would graduate from an institution like IBA, maybe another 50 from somewhere else. And then there were X number of companies that would kind of be able to absorb that. Now you have 2,000 kids. You have like four different programs. So it's not only the 
the, the problem of the demand, it's a supply side. So if the top 10, 15 don't make it to the top 20 desired MNC, I'm not even saying or FMCGs or banks or whatever. I mean, these are not places which give you the, you know, authentication that that's it. You are in the perfect place. It all depends on what your career goals are, what your mindsets are. So it is, you know, so there are students who have that conscious decision that we don't want to go into mainstream employment and mainstream functional roles, right? So for them, it's a lot more of an opportunity and options. Um, so you can look at it from that perspective that, yes, a lot of companies coming in has balanced the supply because where else are so many kids going to go firstly? And secondly, it's given an outlet for those kids or an opportunity for those kids who kept saying that it's all about corporate slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Today, they don't use that word. Because when you are training students with a skill set, you are talking about entrepreneurial opportunities, you're talking about startup opportunities, and then you're talking about the mainstream employment. So I think it's always good to have options for students so that they are able to, you know, figure out where they want to be. A lot of them will join a startup, leave and be back to square one. But then that is, this is the time to do that. And so with startups, are you noticing that the culture is different and how is there a difference in how students are reacting to uh, their first, let's say, couple of weeks in a startup relative to how they would react in their first couple of weeks at a multinational? See, an organization that has been running a management training or an internship program for the last 100 years since its existence or for the last 50 years, 20 years, they have a structure, they have an HR process, they'll have orientations, they'll have... so. You know, there is a day one, day two, day three, day four. But organizations that, you know, have the startup culture, people are younger. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of and it's basically everybody's running and the new kids that come in have to join the race. Right. So there's a difference in the way an intern or an MT is treated when you go to an organization where there is something called the MT program or an intern mm -hmm. program versus. So, yes, there is a lot of despondency. Uh, in terms of situations where you feel that you haven't been allocated the work, right? And of course, the work from home culture doesn't um, help the cause because you're not in the face of the people who you're working. So unless you're not top of the mind recall for them, they, they forget to assign a task to you. And then you are concerned that, oh, I have a six week time and maybe I'm not going to be learning enough. So yes, that is a bit of a difference because it's, they're not structured as yet. Right. And that and so is the what, one common thing that I have heard. And so what should the, let's say, the young recruit at a startup where there are no systems or process? It's just a goal to get to, let's say, the next milestone before you run out of cash. What should that student be mindful of? Or if they're facing that challenge, how should they tackle that challenge? See, I think being in an environment like this where everybody is just in the same pool of achieving whatever the goals are, I think it's an opportunity for students. It's an opportunity to test his or her persuasive skills. It's an opportunity to test his or her, how should I be top of the mind recall? It's an opportunity to initiate, suggest, you know, kind of uh, plug in. Um, but it is testing your ability that tomorrow, if you want to sell something to an audience which is completely deaf and dumb and doesn't need what you want, this is an opportunity where you say, OK, this is how I'm going to sell myself. So I look at it as an opportunity. And that's the advice that I give my students, because you see, students also have this strange mindset that, you know, they think about a comfy office. And a, so it, it jolts them a little bit when that it doesn't fit in what they thought, you know, the transition from campus to corporate would be. But I think high energy power pack startups are very, very strong learning grounds for students who want to test their skills. You know, when you learn in an unstructured environment, you really learn how to structure things for yourself. And that is skill addition. So then let me ask this question. There would always be this question sort of when I graduated from college and the startup scene had just picked up uh, globally. Should you work at a startup right after college first or at a bigger, older company, a multinational, or someone who's been in business for 20, 40 years and has the systems and processes in place. Which one is the better choice? Okay, so if you look at the local mindset, if you're talking about the Pakistani mindset, um, unfortunately, a lot of students make these decisions because of lack of options. Um, the majority mindset, we still have that mindset that, you know, it has to be the top 10, top 15, all right? So everybody will gun for that. 
And when those start falling like dominoes, for whatever reasons, you don't make it through the recruitment processes, then these become options. Um, there's a very handful, a very small number um, who make an organization which is a newer organization their first preference. Either because, you know, they know that they have things that they would like to pursue themselves, they have an entrepreneurial mindset, or they have family businesses to go to, and they have a timeline to which they feel that, you know, they need that outside exposure. But if you look at our local mindset, there's there are very few people who raise their hands and say, you know what, this is going to be my first uh, so the run towards the established organizations is there. Um, but because, like I said, supply and demand. So all those who are in supply find a placement in these organizations. Interesting. And so if I flip it now, I mean, if I look at it from the perspective of the employer, do you think that the students that are coming out are ready? Uh, and if I'm an employer, let's say that's been around for 20, 30 years, a larger corporation, you know, been in business for a long time. Do you think the students today are ready to fit into my structure, which is sort of built on tradition and you know systems and processes, or are students going to be adrift in a structure like this or an environment like this? You see, you see, the thing is that a, I mean, like I said, I've been a product of the same institution and I'm working, so the evolution that I've seen, it's it's just it's a great eye opener, right? Um, I remember going for interviews, training students for interviews when I started my teaching career, that open a textbook and that's what's going to come the next day, right? But today, no matter what structures there are, skill sets and personal skills are taking priority. And going forward, I think COVID is going to seal that. I mean, the people who were asked to leave the organization, they were the people who could probably functionally perform. But to put it in a very layman's language for people to understand is they probably couldn't lead from sitting on a digital screen. That's it. And the mm -hmm. 10 people who were asked to stay back and were not asked to leave the organization in terms of layoffs, etc., were those people who had the functional skills because everybody in organization has functional skills. Otherwise, you'd be thrown out a long time back, right? Right. But they also had the skills to lead during challenges, crisis, digital mediums, work, all that put together. And that's when an organization wants you. So no matter how much, you know, there is structure, there is processes, um, there has to be very, very strong personal skills to kind of grow in those structures. Otherwise, you can be stamping treasury bills for 20 years because you're good at that function, which is part of the structure. But the but how do you, in, in that how do you grow is, that though? How do you grow that personal interaction or that personal skill when we are spending more and more time in front of our screens? You see, again, the point is that it's it's about an opportunity. It's about how do you what what are the me mechanisms that you're putting um to have like a team meeting how are you motivating your team for example are you just you know kind of just doing these boring emails and saying that so there has to be innovation at the workplace the entire workplace has innovated right so mm -hmm. how does a departmental head galvanize demotivated despondent people whose internets may not be working they have infrastructure issues. They may not be able to have a solo room for them to work for. So how is that person who is in charge of these 10, 15, 20 people move forward with that insurance, with assurance, motivation? You see, the structure has not collapsed. But the person who is leading people within that structure has to use a different technique. Interesting. Right? And so are you finding that in your trainings with corporates, is this something you are spending more time on making them aware or is there something else that you feel that they need to focus on first during this time? I mean, it's interesting in the last 10 years, I think um, the reason why my interest in corporate training and personal consulting went up is because no matter what function you are in, um, organizations are craving skills such as communication, leadership, teamwork. There was an organization that actually called me in to train 150 IT people. And I really thought that they had written the wrong department on their contract or something. And when I spoke to them, they said, no, we want personal skills even in that group of people whose only interface is email. But we want them to have the desire that they, they are not going to be software developers the whole life. They need to move up to you know higher positions and higher roles. So the last couple of years has just been an eye opener in terms of senior people i've i've trained senior people to the basics of how to communicate it's tough their resistance 
Um, it's a resistant lot. They're reluctant because they're like 25 years, we're doing okay. Why the hell do we need to do this? Right. Uh, but again, you have to pitch it in terms of personal growth. And once you go through the process, it's that bulb that goes and says, oh yeah, now we get it. So what are the, so, what are the basics of communication in, in today's, let's say, work from home environment? What, are, what would you say are the, let's say, top three things you recommend? See, again, it's about being able to connect with people, not just be physically present on the screen. It's about making that connection. That connection can be through, um, say, perhaps a certain uh, you know, activity that you do, or a certain style that you have, or a certain methodology of speaking. So it's very important to connect with people who are not sitting with you in the same office space. That's the first thing. The second most common thing is, and which is what I've been doing a lot of trainings on, is again, how to create that impact when you're on a screen, right? Um, there's a lot of people who may not be very coherent with the language. They're not, they may not be very coherent with, um, you know, they're always coherent with content, right? You're all, you talk more professionals, but sometimes it's the language. Sometimes it's, it's the barrier of the fact that there are three people sitting on the screen. Who should you look at? Where should the eye contact be? You know, should we be looking at our own selves while we are talking? So these are the kind of things that, so I did something for an organization also um, last month. And the three things that I actually highlighted to them was number one, you know, think about galvanizing your team in unique methodologies, because that's the best way you can get across what you want if you're not sitting together. The second thing is that, you know, have the confidence and treat the digital medium as, you know, as the new, new norm. Um, mm -hmm. And the third thing, last thing is don't shy away from it. A lot of people will still try and say, okay, let's talk on the phone. WhatsApp call, kar le, voice notes. Bhej de. These are the common things that I, when I do a survey of questions that what are some of the things that you prefer to do? WhatsApp call, kar le, voice notes, bhej de, achha, hai, phone, kar le te. but the last thing they want to do is Zoom, Team or Google Meet, right? Because and there's a video talk, interaction. Yeah. Yeah, and this you talk about upper management, they're okay. But I'm talking about when you train masses of middle and lower management, that's where the barriers are there still. So it's a challenge of people's confidence, you think, yeah, that the, inter the, the confidence they need because there's something very slightly intrusive about being on a screen. Yes. And then, yes. you know, when something, let's say there's a big team meeting happening yeah. and you're sort of passively participating, a lot of people will just kind of zoom in and see like yes. what are everyone else up to, you know? <laughs> you know. So suddenly if you're on the receiving end of that and you're caught at a wrong time and you're scratching your head or you're distracted, yeah. it's a little and, and it's and it's technology. Bijli jati hai, generator nahi chalta. Uh, you know, bura impression padta hai, dobara connect karna padta hai, request to join in. It's it's stressful versus right. walk into somebody's room in a boardroom and sit there and your mind can be switched off, but you look cool. You know, right. it's, it's, it's that it's that it's that fear of that things can go wrong on a digital medium. They totally can go wrong. So if something does happen, let's say now let's give a hypothetical. If you remember, there was a, I think it was maybe about a year ago. There was someone on uh, one of the news channels yeah. talking the and then the, the BBC. Right. And yeah. their kid kind of crawled in and the mom crawled in at the back. If something odd like that happens, you know, and you're in the middle of a call and your entire team's there or your senior management is there. What is the best way to tackle that, in your opinion? Just look really cool. That's it. <laughs> it. I mean, it happens. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was actually talking to a senior HR person and her kid did walk in, but she picked right. up the kid and put her in her lap and it was all cool. My daughter right. studying in a college abroad and she said that her cat interrupts the classes all the time. Right. So she and all the cat wants is to be held and the cat will sit very quietly but as long as she's in the lap. So she picks up the cat and a student, I mean, a class of 150 kids know the name of the cat. And if right. she's not there, one of them asks, where's the cat? Right. So it's, it's about, <laughs> you know, it's about how when you show fear and you show anxiety right. and you show there's something wrong, your audience is going to become the bully. Right. Right. Uh, an audience is always waiting to pounce on you. By the way. They, they, right. An audience is known to be bullies, whether it's a presentation or whatever. But right. the minute you're cool about these things and you make it part of it, you know, the audience, your emotions, you know, kind of trans are, a, you know, make an impact on the audiences also. So I think you just have to be cool. <laughs> so, so that means that we should accept that work from home or this hybrid is going to be a permanent part of the entire oh, yeah. Pakistani, let's say, landscape of employment. 
I mean, of course, I mean, today your every news channel, every social media page is all talking about the fourth wave. We've just, right. We are just chasing our own tail. Um, and I think now organizations will legally have to give that option to, uh, to uh, the employees. And once that happens, um, you know, you will have to go on a hybrid. You, can't, you really can't force people to come to work anymore. Right. I mean, it can be having compromised people at home, you being whatever the reason. But if the person commits that I'm available nine to five, but through a screen, I think the employees are going to have to uh, accept that. And do you think productivity has uh, changed, improved, uh, dec decreased with work from home? How, what are the um, corporates telling you about productivity when it comes to, let's say, employment you and know, students? I, and I, think, I think it depends from person to person. For a lot of people, the main like IBA had a survey about in the right in the beginning that how has work from an online you know impact um so a lot of people respond back and they say generally that there's no nine to five anymore just because you're online you're just working 12 hours of the day and if you say no i'm busy at four sure let's connect at seven right um so I does that mean there's no more boundaries anymore there used to be yeah. a finite boundary nine yeah. to five ten to six whatever it was right i think that's one of the thing which is predominantly i've been hearing in the discussions that um, the expectations to be available around the clock because it's on a digital medium, phone, everything else. So that's a common thing. It's not something that I have because, I mean, also depends on personality. If you're a workaholic, then for you, then this is a great, uh, great right. time to be in, right? Uh, but this has been the common thing that somehow we feel that the boundaries of time have, um, the expectations are that if you're home, we can get in touch with you anytime. Once so that means office, that that's the end. That means your life is a, let's say, sort of a fusion between work life, home life, personal life, yeah. play, right? Yeah, yeah. So that yeah. means I would make the assumption then you really must be passionate about what you do. Otherwise, if you don't like what you do and it's intrusive in your everyday life, or had, let's say, ghante pe koi aake kehte, ab meeting kar lo, tab meeting kar lo. Matlab, if you're not enjoying what you do, then you have a big problem. So passion, I think, now for the first time. Um, probably means something you know they talk about oh you should be passionate about your career yeah. or follow your passion or you know pick something that you are passionate about I think now more than ever with based on what you said passion should be the priority when you think about how do I select my career path you know uh, Fazan, one of the few questions or the opening questions that I ask in a lot of my sessions on my introductory sessions is is what is that one thing that you'd want from your employment, right? Or wherever you want to. And a lot of people raise their hands and they say work-life balance. All right. I try and control my whatever. And I just basically tell them, I said, hey, abhi to aap graduate bhi nahi hoi aur aap work-life balance yeah. rahe. And then I just tell them, Ke, the thing that makes you high, all right, you will never look for that work-life balance. Right. You want to go home at five because you're bored and you're tired and you're fed up. And the minute you say, I'm going home at five, it's like, I'm going to work-life balance. Right? Mm -hmm. So any, I mean, there are people who will leave the office at five and come grumpy to a family event. What happened? Oh, I'm going to office. Mein. And then there are people who will crash land in their tie to a family event and be the life of that event. And mm -hmm. where were you late? I'm coming from work. Mm -hmm. Right? So... To answer your question that, yes, anything that you're high on, um, it's not going to bother you, right? It's not going to take you down. It's not going to demotivate you. It's not going to be a killjoy for you, right? So, so the same thing. Um, and of course, now the difference is that passion has a definition. Passion has a name. I mean, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, brand management was a passion. But today, being a culinary chef, being an art curator, being a playwright, being an actor, uh, being a nutritionist, a fitness coach, these are all careers. And how do how does an education institution like the one you're at help people discover what they are passionate about? Because everything else is wired for that traditional marketing, finance, IT, computer science, you know, engineering, law, you know, it's very structured and old school but the name the career paths you just named how do you even discover those in an academic environment if you are to pursue your passion as a career see the first thing that i i communicate is the fact that if your passion is the same thing as your career then that's a jackpot right if you can earn out of being a chef and earn out of being an artist and have that 
income that you are looking for, then that's like an ideal situation, right? I mean, um, and a lot of people manage to do that. The second thing, a lot of people don't have that, right? This, the people who don't have that, I am constantly, every engagement or interaction that I have with my student, I am constantly doing this through class lectures or through sessions or workshops or whatever you may call it, that students understand the language of a resume. But this is our life document that will take us from here to and I always tell them that your last part of extracurriculars and skill set is to focus on it as much as you do on the top There is a possibility that your research and your corporate experiences start becoming homogenous. Hmm. Right? Because too many people are doing the same internships. But I said a passion that you have of rowing or baking or you know, kind of social work or something that may just be unique to you because you may have done something which is very different. So the part that I play through a program at my institution is to constantly create that diversity, firstly. Secondly, employers are looking for that diversity now. They totally are because the question to introduce yourself has to be showcased as a result of that diversity. Right. Otherwise, what they've done in terms of the academic achievements um, is something that's there. And the other thing is that coming from institutions that are strong in terms of academic empowerment, there is no doubt on academic empowerment. You never question how a student comes, you know, knowing his 42 courses at all the top institutions, but you are questioning his ability to apply that to situations, right? Mm. Um, so so for, for me, and I think we are trying to create this theme in the, in, in the, uh, in the institution that, you know, you have to create that diversity. And that is why, say, I tell non-business students that internationally, you guys probably have the strongest degree. But because you can write well, you can speak well, you can curate well, that is sometimes what's probably necessary even in brand management. You know? Fair point. Um, so I think the, the, the you have to constantly keep reminding the students that in the race to achieve the academic ticks, they cannot forget you know, how they can create that differentiation. And that comes through their pursuit. And it doesn't have to be, you know, something extraordinary. Like, yes, somebody who cooks at home. And by the way, COVID really uh, promoted that. The number of home chefs that came out, so many of students at IPA were like baking, selling, you know, they were doing all kinds of things. I mean, so when you come to a dead end, your mind yourself tells you, okay, up to hum bahar bhi nahi nikal sakte. You know, mm -hmm. kuch bhi nahi hai, ab hum kya kare? and they came up with the most creative things and they're still pursuing it, even though they're back to being like a normal student life. So if you had to restart your career and assume, let's say you just graduated from college and were picking your career path and this is the world we live in that we are in today. What would be the path you pick for yourself? You know, you'll understand the path that I'll pick for myself when I tell you what I want to do after I retire. <laughs> Which and is... I want to take sculpture classes and I want to be a, somebody who does sculptures. Very That's cool. what I want to do. I, I, I think it's therapeutic. And perhaps had I not been from their generation where if you are not a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer, you couldn't make a life of yourself, I would not have done an MBA degree probably. Right. But it was a point that I had to prove. I had to make sure that I got into banking. And even then it was, I mean, I was a banker and it was a huge step for me to let that go and go into teaching. I mean, the monetary compensation is like, it's like you can't even Big think difference. about it, right? And That's there true. were lots of people who are pulling you down that you're leaving banking and you're going into teaching. And But passion That's is true. what I pursued. <laughs> I did the same thing and I completely That's understand. True. You have to yeah. follow the path of passion. Otherwise, exactly. chasing the money never really makes yeah. you happy. And I think That's passion true. makes you that personality. It gives you... Uh, you know, I, that's what I tell. If you're a passionate person, you have a passion, you get up at six in the morning and you jog and you cycle or whatever, you are a fun person to be at work with. You know, when you mm. come at nine in the morning, you are a fun team member, right. right? So when people pursue passions, they're fun to be with. Good insights, Nadia. Thank you so much. I think the takeaway for me, well, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to change my path, but for whoever is looking to kick off their career, I think focusing on your passion um, articulating thought and being able to communicate yourself and not being shy about com you know complicated situations and just being cool about them. I think sort of that was my takeaway from this. Yes. And I appreciate the time. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Hopefully I'll see 
Hopefully, I'll see you in person in your lectures now, rather oh, than yeah, yeah, yeah. them in person. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Next semester start, and you're going to be back on campus. <laughs> Fantastic! Thank you Thank so you much, so Nadia. Much. Take care. Thank all you all right. for tuning in. Till the next okay. episode of Digitales. Bye bye.